a little louder. You, you know, you've got a my microphone, mic. and they, I'm just trying to maybe have the mic pick up uh, okay. some of my. Okay. Um, you could just state your name, your full name, your branch of service, and your dates of service for me. My name's Dave Iannone. David. Uh, I was born on July 11, 1926 in Brooklyn, New York. Went into service November 11, 1944, out of college. I was in college at the time. Uh, did my basic training, uh, infantry training at uh, Camp Wheeler, Georgia. Uh, was sent overseas uh, February, March of 45. I was briefly assigned to the 103rd Infantry Division in Innsbruck and then that unit was uh, redeployed to the States and we were transferred to the 42nd Infantry Division, also in Innsbruck at the time. Uh, and I was a basic rifleman, infantryman with uh, Company B, 1st Battalion of the 242nd Infantry Regiment, as part of the Rainbow Division. Uh, we were stationed in and around Salzburg for a long time. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the time that I spent was guarding. Uh, I think we had five thousand or six thousand German prisoners of war, Wehrmacht troops and SS troopers, and uh, it was a regular, round the clock routine, uh, guard duty kind of thing for, for many months. Uh, then my unit, uh, the company was detached. My platoon was detached. We wound up in the mountains somewhere. One of the towns was named Caprun, and we were doing uh, inspection of the displaced person camps. They had barracks and some, some good-sized residential buildings, and it was our responsibility to go in and um, inspect for cleanliness, for safety, because they had stoves and stuff, and they had to make sure that there were no fire hazards, mm -hmm. and that people were keeping the place clean so that uh, there were no problems. We only had one real incident, uh, we found uh, somebody who had hanged himself supposedly in the bathroom, but he didn't hang himself, somebody hung him. I, th I think he was caught squealing about something, because you can't hang yourself and have your feet touching the ground. So somebody strung him up. Uh, but that was the only bad experience. Uh, after that, we were in and around Salzburg for a long time. And then I got the opportunity in, uh, in the fall of 45, I opened the Rainbow University in Zellemsee, Austria, right on the lake. And I spent, uh, I spent a full semester there. I took three courses, uh, English Lit, Physics, and uh, Government. And I got credit for it when I got back to, to college. And it was a terrific experience. It's in our big book. Uh, uh, the residential building was called Yankee Hall, named after one of the former officers of the 42nd Division. Uh, it was about a two month, I guess it was an eight week course. They had some excellent instructors. Uh, one who impressed me was a PFC who had a doctorate uh, from NYU, as a matter of fact. And he, he, I think he was a, a company clerk. He was, he was a buck corporal. But, but he was a fantastic guy. He knew, he knew more about government than politics. And part of what we did is we interviewed local, local government officials as part of our uh, approach to not only United States government, government in general in the other areas. So it's quite an experience. And as I said, I got credit for it too. So it made life easier because I, I wound up finishing college only one year after I normally would have, even though I'd been in service almost two years. Because I went to one summer school and I picked up nine credits there. And I went to summer school and picked up another probably nine, which is a semester right there. Well, I was lucky because I was in college when I was 16 and a half. I had a year and a half of college before I went into service. And you got drafted? And, no, I got drafted. Uh, I had a good time that last semester because I knew I was getting drafted, so I was cutting classes and <laughs> hanging out with the guys down in the cafeteria, so it was a good time. But one of the best things that happened, when we were stationed up in Caprun, we were only there a week, and somebody called me down to the orderly room and said, pack your gear, you're going down to division headquarters. I said, what for? That's, the lieutenant said, no, just get on their truck and they'll take you down. Fine, they didn't give me any orders. 
I didn't know where I was going and why. Can't be all bad. Slept my barracks bag and a duffel bag, get on the back of a two and a half ton truck, ride for two hours in November, freezing my butt off. And we finally get to division headquarters. They don't know me from Adam. I walk into, they said G4 section, which is supply, I remember that, because I had been in ROTC when I was in, uh, at City College. In fact, I was a cadet lieutenant, second lieutenant, as an 11, which was unusual. But what happened, a lot of the older guys who were officers in the ROTC had been already drafted, so the few of us that were there who knew anything about close order drill and the manual of arms and the laws and whatever, we got bucked up right away. Uh, but when I reported, it was during lunchtime, and there was a charge of quarters there. And he said, uh, now I came off the line, so I'm not wearing a jacket and tie, I'm wearing, you know, OD, but uh, rough, I'm dirty. We were washing our own clothes. No, it wasn't combat, I never did see combat, but we were, we were an active duty on the line outfit. I thought I was a truck driver, because truck driver. Supply involves transportation, and uh, uh, quartermaster was part of, part of G4. So he said, uh, so what are you doing here? I said, I don't know. I had all, they, they told me to report. What for? As I said, it was lunchtime. So he said, did you have lunch? I said, no. So he pulls out a card, and he says, go out of the building, turn right, go over the bridge, go three blocks, make another right. There's a hotel. Go to the second floor and have lunch. Now I'm coming off the line where we're eating out of mess kits. I walk upstairs. There's a dining room with waitresses coming around serving. So when I went back, the chief clerk, who was a little guy, he was a master sergeant. But that was, the chief clerk was a master sergeant. He said, uh, would you like to be trip? I think either, either the fact that I had just gotten out of uh, Division University, you know, the Rainbow University, or the fact that on my orders, I, I could speak and read Italian and Spanish, and I could type. I had, I had taken typing in high school, so it listed me as 45 minutes, 45 words a minute as a typist. And that's what they needed. So I said, would you like to be transferred here? I could have kissed them. I said, you want Living in a hotel? I'm coming off the line. I look like a bum. They had all the facilities to send your laundry out. The, the maids made the beds in the morning. You went for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you sat down and was served like a king. That was in uh, January, January 45. I didn't know it at the time, but I had just made PFC in December. The interesting thing about that, nobody ever did any paperwork on my transfer. So I was at division headquarters at G4 section for two months. I didn't get one letter, one package, nothing. So I'm trying to find out Company B. Where's Company B now? Because we, had, as I said before, we, my platoon had been detached. B had been Company had been detached from the from the battalion. They were finally back on the outskirts of, of uh, Sa uh, Salzburg. So I uh, found where they were, and I went out. First guy I meet is the first sergeant. He says, "Where the hell have you been? We got you a wall." I says, what do you mean? I'm in division headquarters. I've been there since the, since the beginning of January. Paperwork had never followed me around. Apparently, G4 section had me transferred because I'd already been promoted. I was a T5 now. I was getting promoted every month. It's a nice deal. Because, because all the guys there were being rotated home. You know, they, they had been with the 42nd from its inception, and they had the points to be able to go home. So all of a sudden, I was acting chief clerk in t two months, three months. And so they, have to, they had to promote me up to the rank that I was entitled to. So every month I got another promotion. I wound up, funny thing happened. Our chief clerk was Swedish, of Swedish ancestry. And they had something called a compassionate furlough, where if you had relatives within the European theater, you could put in for a uh, two week plus travel time to, st to go visit. He put in, he got it, so he went to Sweden. I said, I had relatives in Italy. I said, I'm gonna put in for it. I got the, 
the two weeks furlough, compassionate furlough, right after, right before he left, he went to Sweden, he came back, and then he was, he was discharged. A bunch of the guys were all going home. I was acting chief clerk. When the orders came through that I could travel down to visit the compassionate furlough, I was, I was a T5, a buck, you know, corporal with a T. We had a buck sergeant and a staff sergeant who were assigned to us. They just were assigned to us. They didn't know it. In fact, I knew more than anybody else at that point, because I'd been there two months. These guys just came off the line, they didn't know anything. So I'm acting chief clerk and I'm trying to get out because I want to go down to visit my, my grandmother, my cousins, my aunts and uncles. So I had to go and talk to Colonel, the, the, the G4 himself was a lieutenant colonel. And he didn't really like me that much because I had a mustache and I used to wear my hair long. And every time, every time I came up for promotion, he look at me and say, get a haircut. I'd have to go get a haircut, you know, short, like, you know, like the guys wear down. I was fine, it's worth the promotion. So I went up to him and I tried to talk him into allowing me to take the furlough. Because you got to remember, the whole unit was brand new. I'm the only one who knows a hell of a lot. So I said, you know, I'm only a corporal and they got a buck sergeant, a staff sergeant. I said, they outrank me, they, they can do the work. So he approved it. Unfortunately, they did so badly, they had to bring in one of the clerks from, from Division of Artillery. He was either a staff sergeant, I think he was a staff sergeant at the time. Now I was gone almost a month because it said two weeks plus travel time. And it took me four days just to get out of Austria because I had to go up into Germany to Munich to come down, to go back through Austria, through the Brenner Pass. And the trains weren't going back and forth from Austria to Italy. I was supposed to walk across the Brenner Pass up in the Alps. Well, fortunately, I, I talked, I won't put it on here, I talked the uh, engineers, because I could speak Italian, I talked the engineers to allow me to go on the, on the engine that went across, otherwise I would have had to walk across. So that's well, I got you know across. Italian because of your No, I, I, I took Italian in school, that's how I know Italian. So I spent two weeks with, uh, with my grandparents and all the aunts and uncles and cousins. In fact, I was in I was in Rome Easter Sunday of 1945. At the, in fact, I have a picture up on the, the top of the dome. Met another guy from Connecticut who was also Italian, and we got a picture showing us sitting up there. Had an interesting experience coming down from the north. We stopped in Trento, Bolzano. I don't remember what train stop. We got out to go get something to eat. We're going back, to, there was a train before us that pulled out. Our, our train was there, we went to eat, we came back. And there's this young guy, he looked like he was about 16 years old. Japanese-American, belonged to the 442nd Infantry Regiment, the Nisei Regiment, I don't know if you ever heard of them. The most decorated unit in World War II. They had more Purple Hearts, Bronze Stars, Silver Stars than any other unit of its size. The train had left without him. Poor kid didn't know what to do. So I said, come with us, we'll take care of you. So we, we all went down through Florence into Rome. We finally found his outfit and got him straightened down. So we're in Rome, and uh, from there I had to go down to Naples, and then to Salerno, and then to my, my grandmother's, my mother's hometown. And I spent a couple of weeks there. Uh, uh, as interesting. On one of the days I was walking past one of the houses, a big villa. And there was a Jeep parked out front with the rainbow on it. You know, the rainbow, I'm rainbow, I'm gonna see who this is. It was a lieutenant who was on detached service, same as me, because as an officer, he had the vehicle to drive. So I went in and introduced myself, and we got to talking. He said, have you been to the Isle of Capri? I said, no. He wrote a note, he said, when you go in, go into, go into Naples, and go to the headquarters wherever, because you had to check in every, any place you went, you, you had to give them a copy of your orders, because then you could draw on the PX, because you know, you needed cigarettes, you needed whatever you needed. So I got a, I got a trip to the Isle of Capri on the lieutenant. I stayed there overnight, an experience I never would have had, because I've never been back to Italy. 
In fact, I was talking to some of the people with, that have seen our exhibit over there who have been to the Isle of Capri. Uh, I vaguely remember it. Yeah, it's a long time ago. But they said, you remember going around on the bus? I said, I'm not going on the bus anymore because there was, it's the side of a mountain and there's a steep drop off. And if the thing goes off, you are way up there. Uh, but that, I, I had a good time. But when I got back, fortunately, the, the, the colonel didn't really bring me out. He, he said, well, they had to bring in the other guy, who then became chief clerk. And he got the three rockers. He was, he was master sergeant. And I finally made tech, which is, well, I think they call it sergeant first class now. I was second in command. Pretty soon he left because he had the time in. By that time, I knew enough to be able to run the office. So that's how I finished up. I was actually, uh, I was the senior non-com when we, when we left. I left the uh, beginning of August of 46. We were on trucks and we were on the train. I carried all the, all the personnel folders as the senior CEO. And then we went up. We came in through La Havre, and I don't remember what, what, what port we left out of. It wasn't La Havre. But it was a long schlep. And do you remember where you were on uh, VE Day? Yeah, we were in... Uh, I remember firing off my M1. We were living in a small town in Austria somewhere. I don't remember the name of the town. We weren't, uh, we weren't doing very much at that point. Because the two big jobs that we had eventually was guarding the prisoners of war and, uh, and, and ins inspecting the DP camps. Explain but this the must prisoners of war, like what, what was your unit responsible for? Was it just the security? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, we had a funny experience. Uh, as I said, we had 5,000 army, army troops, and there were 1,000 SS troopers in a separate, separate area, because that, that was higher security. So we were either on the gates or on a guard tower with a machine gun. We had 30, the 30 heavy, the water-cooled machine gun, or you were at a gate with your rifle or a grease gun. And sometimes we'd have to walk through to inspect, and you didn't go in with a weapon. You left the weapons outside. And they used to take them out on work details. The service company used to come in with two and a half ton trucks, take them by the hundreds. You know, rebuilding roads, uh, demolishing uh, war damaged things. And a lot of the guys who would be working out in, in the countryside, we used to notice they had, all the, all, the, all the crowds had little knapsacks. They'd walk out and they were flat. And they walked back in and they were puffed up. So one day we decided to find out what the hell is going on here, what are these guys doing? So we had the empty mount. They were bringing food, potatoes, tomatoes, uh, veg, cabbages. Now we were still eating dehydrated potatoes, dr dried eggs. These guys are coming in with fresh eggs and fresh potatoes and it really burned us up. Now, these guys are getting it and we're not. So we wound up that day and we created a problem because Sergeant of the Guard got called. We had a mound of stuff this hard. So they turned it all into the common mess f for all of them. And we said, that's the last time we're gonna do that because if, if the guy had enough gumption and in initiative to go out and scrounge up food, let him keep it, not turn it into the guys who are sitting back, twiddling their thumbs and expecting to get it. So we only did that one time, but it was funny because nobody said, who told you to do this? Then you say, you know, you point your finger at somebody else. But we, I was 19 years old. Doing your job. Well, yes and no. Because these kids, they weren't going anywhere. In, in all the time we were there, I think there was one escape. And whoever designed the camp wasn't too smart. The back of the camp, which was the darkest and most remote place, had only one strand of wire. Everything else had double strand with, with, the, with the concertina wire in between. The back ones, there's one strand of wire and the railroad tracks were back there. And anybody who had the walking post in that area usually wound up sitting on the tower 
because he didn't feel like walking up and down in the dark by himself. There was one young kid, he was really gung-ho. He used to walk his post. They tried breaking out. They saw people running. He started the fire, he killed two guys, caught two guys, two or three of them got away. They took him off guard duty. They wouldn't let him, they wouldn't let him guard anymore. Because they figured maybe somebody, you know, knowing that he had killed a couple of the escapees, they might try to do him in. So they transferred him. He was, he was, he was PW chasing. PW means P, not, not prisoners of war, but guys, American soldiers who were in the, in the, in, in the detention barracks for being AWOL or whatever. They used to send them out on details. And he used to, he was, he was their, their guard. He used to carry a carbine and follow them around town wherever they had to go. So he, he said, oh man, I lucked out. I got a good job now. <laughs> the things that happen, you know, fortuitously sometimes. You, right. you don't know what you're doing. Exactly. The only thing about that thing was scared me. When we first got there, we, we were up on a tower. There's a big machine gun, a water-cooled machine gun. 30 caliber heavy. It was a 30 heavy in those days. There was no water in the jacket. And there was no ammo in the, in the box. I mean, it was just to show. Couldn't use it. So we used to go up there and we'd bring our own rifle. But well, one of the guys had, had seen combat. He, he had a P-38. It was like the Luger. So instead of carrying the rifle, we'd carry a pistol. But I was scary. I said, suppose they try to get out of here. We're not going to stop them with, with, with one rifle. Or whatever, two of us. Two rifles are not going to stop. Machine gun might. You know, you fire a burst and they know, hey, hey, bad news. So we made believe. We went, showed, because the prisoners were down there. We walk around and they'd watch. So we walked up and we filled it up with water. We bought, we bought a cartridge box and laid it down. Made it look real. We still didn't have any ammo though. I mean, I mean, with one company, you know, that's 240, 240 men. And you got 5,000, 6,000 guys in there. You have no way of stopping them if they want it out. Well, they didn't run it. The war was over, or just about. So they, they were better off there than trying to get out. Sure, sure. Now, explain some of your uh, medals here. You have a bunch of medals in this state. Well, the... the European, American, uh, Africa, Middle East campaign medal. Anybody who served in France, Germany, Austria, Southern Italy, North Africa, that was a campaign medal that you were entitled to, whether you saw combat or not. If you were in there, and I don't remember, there was a time limit. You had, had to have been in, well, I was in the ETA. I, I was in service 21 months. I was over 60, I overseas 17 months of the, of the 21 months. I was only in the States four months, basic training. Uh, so I qualified for the, uh, the ETO medal. In fact, I, I lost them and I wrote, I wrote to uh, somewhere in Missouri and I got, I got the whole new set. Uh, everybody who was in service got the World War II victory medal because we won the war. I served in Germany with the occupation troops. As I said, we were guarding PWs, so that's the um, uh, uh, Army of Occupation Medal, Germany, because there's an Army of Occupation, Japan, because they did the same thing over there. They had prisoners of war, and they had, so that was Army of Occupation Service. You didn't even have to guard PW, PWs, as long as you were stationed there after the war to kind of keep the peace. And the Good Conduct Medal, I earned, even, even though I got court-martialed a couple, no, I didn't get court-martialed. Well, I went back to college. Uh -huh. I finished my master, my bachelor's at City College where I had been. Graduated June of 1948 and I got married to my girlfriend who I knew from before the war. We used to correspond. Uh, so we got married in September of 48. And I got a New York State War Service Scholarship. Took the test and got the scholarship because Actually, when I went to City College, it was free for me anyway. But when I came back, I went in under the GI Bill so that I could get the stipend because 
not only they paid the tuition, but they gave you, I don't remember, I think it was $105 a month, because I was married. Uh, then I got the War Service Scholarship, so I was able to get my master's at NYU, because I couldn't, uh, couldn't do anything with the BA. It was a BA in Spanish and Latin. What was your master's in? My master's was in Spanish and Education Administration. I took all the necessary education courses so I could teach, but I took all the courses because I later became an assistant principal, so I had all those courses behind me. And I got, I got my, uh, my master's in February 1950. And I started teaching in, uh, in September 1950. I worked part-time. I worked uh, with, with the post office department um, down in Lower Manhattan. Four hours of temp part-time temporary substitute, <laughs> but we were getting two dollars and thirty-five cents an hour, and that's high at, for 1946-47. That was a lot of money. Uh, so it kept body and soul together. My wife worked for about six months, then she became pregnant. My daughter was born in October '49. When I got my masters, I started teaching in February in my old junior high school, same one I went to. I spent 36 years in my high, my junior high. That was the same high school I went to. And uh, so I was in the classroom for 17 years, and then I became an assistant principal. And I was the same school, 17 years. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add about any of your experiences? Or you, did you find the well, military worthwhile? Well, as I said before, I was in the ROTC. I liked the military. I, I liked close order drill. I liked the weaponry. I liked the, the discipline. Uh, you know, the whole routine of you know saluting and the flag. You know, I was gung ho about patriotism and that whole kind of thing. My brother, who was older than I am, was already in service. He was in the Air Force. Uh, he was lucky. He was in three years, never got out of the United States. Uh, but to be honest with you. If I hadn't been in college, I would have considered making the army my career. Because when I was over, before I left overseas in Austria, they were they were trying to they were trying to get a lot of us to re-enlist. And as Chief Clerk, they offered me opportunity to go to OCS, which tempted me a little bit. But I said, I got to go back and finish school because I'd already had a year and a half. At this point, I'm 20 years old. I think I better, you know, try to make up for lost time. Plus, I didn't want to. I didn't want to serve another three years in Europe because they would send you home for a month, then you went back to school and you stayed there. You had to serve the three years there. As I said, I was corresponding with my girlfriend, and we had plans for marriage because, as I said, I got out in '46. We got married in '48, so it wasn't too long. But I, I liked the. Well, one thing that it did for me, it helped me grow up because when I when I was in high school. I was in high school when I was 13. I got out of high school when I was 16. I was in college when I was 16 and a half. I was a kid. I was socially immature. Physically, I was, you know, I was as big then and stronger than I am now, but I was, I was in good shape. And I, and I liked it. Uh, but it did help me that two year, 21 months, two year gap, I matured. Uh, you know, I was on my own for, for two years. You learn to make decisions, you learn how to deal with people. You know, you got the opportunity to be in a command position, you know, like you're the chief clerk now. You got seven, eight guys working for you, you got to make sure they do what they do. You got to help them learn what they, because <laughs> like I got there and I didn't know from beans, they were transferred in. They could type, but they didn't know anything about office procedure or whatever. So it worked pretty well. It was a, a, a growing and learning experience, a maturing experience. And fortunately, although I would, I would have liked to have earned the, the combat, the infantry combat bid, but you had to be in combat, and it, it was almost what happened. I probably would have seen combat. When we came overseas, we landed in La Havre, and a buddy of mine and I volunteered for work detail, getting uh, captured enemy material and surplus material, loaded on trucks, unloading on trucks, 
and we worked up a sweat. It was cold. I mean, this was uh, uh, April, March, March, April of 45. And uh, we both got sick. He got pneumonia, I got bronchitis. We both wound up in the hospital. I lost him. He got pneumonia so bad that they had to take, I, I was in a station hospital. They, they sent him to a general hospital. I never saw him after that. So I was in the hospital for eight days. And when I got out, they send you to a replacement depot to reassign you. I was in a replacement depot for a month. Guys are coming in and out of this place. They're in two, three days a week and they're gone. In two, three days a week. I was the only guy left in the, in the tent. I used to go to the lieutenant and says, you know, when I get out of here, just don't worry about it. Fortunately, we were stationed uh, less than an hour from Paris. So I got to Paris twice. Because they said, you know, if I'm going to be here on the weekend, nothing's going to happen. They don't give you orders on the weekend. Well, weekend passed, I went to Paris. But I was in there for a whole month. I said, when do I get any place? It was frustrating because I had just gotten overseas. I wanted to get, I wanted it. I was gung-ho. I wanted to see combat. Yeah, I wanted to see combat. To see if I, you know, had the, had the guts to take somebody shooting at you. You know, you want to know what, what you're made of. And the only way to find out is when somebody is on the other end of the rifle looking your way. Now, you talked so, about some of the equipment that you got sick because you didn't have the proper equipment. How did you feel? No, no, that, that had nothing to do with okay. it. We, we just volunteered. We were, we were stupid. We worked hard. We worked up sweat and took off all our clothes. Oh, okay. And it caught a chill. Sure. Which, you know... Did you find back then that it was something that they were prepared to do with all the equipment and the cold weather? We went on sick call the following morning. Walked into the... Uh, there was one, one, one real structure. And the medic took our temperature. That must have been 103 or 104. He says, how do you feel? I'm coughing. Okay, wait outside. Next thing I know, go get your gear. You can only take, we had, we had a duffel bag and a barracks bag with all our, all our gear, plus our rifle. You had to turn in a rifle, you had to turn. Only could take the little, little hand thing that, that went underneath uh, the, the full field pack. There was a, a little uh, hand satchel type thing. That's all you could take, plus the clothes you were wearing. So I lost. A full set of ODs. I never got them. I had to go scrounging after after I got out of the hospital. And I was wearing cast-off shirts, and I couldn't get my size. The shirt used to come down to here. That's how I, I got in trouble. The shirt was so long, it was like this. And I looked lousy, so I used to open a button and fold it. So we went into Salzburg one day, and like an idiot, we walked right by Second Corps headquarters, and unfortunately there was a, a lieutenant and a sergeant on duty right at the top of the stairs. And as we walked by, and I said, I got my sleeves rolled up. It's shades button, I'm wearing a tie, the whole thing. Lieutenant, I see him talk to the sergeant, the sergeant comes down, see your dog tags. You're out of uniform. So I rolled the thing down, I said, you know, does that look more military than this? So the lieutenant said, you're out of uniform. Summary court martial. <laughs> well, I really would love to thank you for coming and telling us your story. Well, really. it's a different perspective because uh, there was another, another guy from the Rainbow who served with them from the time they were uh, put together in the States, he went over with them as a unit. I went over as a replacement. So I didn't really know that many uh, of the guys because he knew a lot of people. And he, he was telling me the other day they have reunions. But I don't know that many because I was only with Company B for a while and then I was in division headquarters for six, eight months. And those guys scattered all over the world. I kept contact. There are three, three guys that I kept contact, one, one of whom died. The other one, I got a card from him last, last year, and I didn't send cards because I said my wife passed away, so I didn't send cards that year. He lives up in North Dakota. And the other guys used to live in Farmingdale, Long Island. And there was one guy from Illinois. 
those are the only three guys that uh, my buddy Jay his name was J J A Y no his 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 name was J period A period J period A period Brassfield Mommy well, changed his name to J A Y you can't have an initial you can't have two initials you gotta have a name so they gave him J A Y is your name J he was he was part Indian we used to look at him and get mad because he he didn't have to shave because he had no no facial hair because of his Indian heritage. No, I see you still a VFW hat. Are you still active? I am not too active. I I joined it because oh, 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 an old dear friend was commander of the of the 851 post, mm -hmm. and he said, Dave, you, you're in, eligible to join. Why don't you join us? And so I joined. But I have I, they meet on the last third Monday of the month, and I have another. I belong to the Sons of Italy, which is really my, my thing. I, I, I belong to them for 33 years. So I do a lot with them. I've been a state officer and a local district officer. I'm the district uh, scholarship chairman because, you know, with my, my, my educational background, they wanted me to be involved with this past, uh, when we were in March, February, March, I got 35 applications for scholarships that we give out. We'll be giving them out next next week up here. Uh, no, over in uh, Ellenville. Uh, we're giving out 108 scholarships. Uh, something like uh, over $100,000. So I, I got 35 applications and I had to screen them down because di my district only has seven. And it's tough to... I had kids with 4.5 GPA, 4.0 is straight A. Well, these kids are taking advanced placement, honors courses. If I had to compete with them, I'd never get to college. Yeah. Unbelievable. And they write, what, what impresses me, one of the things that impresses me, they write so much better than some of the teachers I used to have in my departments. But they used to bother me. I had English teachers, English teachers of English, we did not speak English too well. And, and they, when I used to write reports, <laughs> I, I, I shake my head and say, I don't believe, I don't believe. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. go on, go on. Talking too much. Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> we want to hear. Start over. 